Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, we hope you enjoy this legal education content, and today may be the day I earn your subscription. For today's case, we are talking about a person who conducted a ballistics test that showed that the defendant was not guilty. He apparently didn't know that he was supposed to share that information with the defendant. The defendant was convicted. The defendant served 17 years in prison before anyone found it out. And now he says, I just didn't know that I was supposed to share the ballistic evidence that showed that the defendant couldn't possibly do it. Had no idea. Didn't know I was supposed to make that evidence available to defendant. I'm sorry about the 17 years in prison, but it's not my fault. This brings us to the case of Vernon Horn versus James Stephenson. Let's discuss whether it might be the guy's fault, you know, for not turning that information over to the defense. Let's get started with that. On January the 23rd of 1999, Vernon Horn and Marquis Jackson went out on a Saturday night in downtown New Haven. The two teenagers met up with some friends at the Alley Cat nightclub and then stopped by Dixwell Deli, a 24-hour convenience store, at around 2.45 a.m. After purchasing a few items, they drove back to Jackson's apartment several blocks away. At around 3.30 in the morning, three masked robbers burst into the deli and opened fire. The shots hit an employee and a customer, Caprice Hardy, who died shortly thereafter. After stealing a cell phone from the store clerk and trying unsuccessfully to raid the cash registers, the robbers fled the scene. A few minutes after the robbery, Horn walked back to the deli. This raised suspicions of the lead detective on the investigation, who believed that perpetrators of homicide tend to return to the crime scene. It's, it's not unknown to happen, turning, returning to the crime scene, delaying, leaving the scene. Yeah, this is reasonable. So, fair enough. After interviewing Horn at the deli and learning that he had spent the night with Jackson, detectives in the police department began building a case against the two teenagers. This is a fairly reasonable place to begin an investigation. These three individuals went to this deli at 2.45. At 3.30, the robbery occurred. A few minutes after, one of them comes back. The police say, revisiting the crime scene. Maybe it's these three guys who robbed the, robbed the scene. Could be. The crimes, criminals have done worse things. So they begin building a case. So far, we're off to an okay start. Let's press on. Numerous evidence, however, suggested the group was not responsible. Call records for the stolen cell phone that was stolen as part of the robbery showed that four out of five calls were to drug dealers or their associates. Because the records did not support a case against Horn and Jackson, the officers suppressed the records for nearly 20 years, hiding them in the basement of a detective's house. But the police over here are just off to a great start, right? It's like, aha, maybe they're responsible. And so then they find out which cell phone was stolen and they trace the calls. And the calls are to these drug dealers and associates. And then the police say, geez, these records don't support that these guys did it. They put them in the basement of a detective's house for 20 years. That's just fantastic police work there. Maybe this evidence is important and you shouldn't put it in the basement of a detective's house for 20 years. Just super great. Let's press on. After identifying these first five calls as Steve Brown, the first of the callers is Steve Brown, a drug dealer. The detectives over here still want to press the case against Horn and Jackson. The detectives even went so far as to coach Brown to provide a false statement implicating the two teenagers to the robbery. <sighs> According to the fabricated story, on the night of the robbery, Horn and Jackson met Brown, all three whom met are African American for the first time at an all white Polish social club, drove him to Dixwell Deli and convinced them to participate in the robbery. Okay, so um, it's going super well over here in investigation land. We moved over from fairly reasonable police posture of maybe these three guys because of revisiting the scene. Stupider things have happened. And then we conducted an investigation based on the cell phone that was stolen. We found that they were calls to these people and that didn't support it. So let's suppress that evidence. Also, the first guy they called was this guy, Steve Brown. Hey, Brown, you're a drug dealer. We can bust your ass. Or what you could do is you can make up a fake story about how you're involved with these guys. This is going over super well here at, at, at this police department. That's just great. It gets worse, though. Most relevant to this appeal, Brown claimed that Horn shot Hardy, the deli customer, with a Beretta. So in the fabricated story, 
Brown says Horn used a Beretta. Shortly after, therefore, the police department sent shell casings and bullet fragments from the crime scene to the Connecticut State Forensic Police Forensic Laboratory. Defendant James Stefferson, the assigned farms, this is the defender in the civil case, not the defendant in the criminal case. So James Stefferson was the firearms examiner. He generated a general rifling characteristic report that listed all firearms models that potentially matched the ballistic evidence using a mar margin of error of plus or minus two thousandth of an inch. A Beretta handgun is not among these possible matches. So they didn't have a gun to match it with. So they sent what they did have to the forensics, to the firearms examiner. Firearms examiner said, okay, I've measured this to two thousandth of an inch. Here's a whole bunch of guns it could have come from. Breda is not on the list. The firearms examiner prepared a memo to the police department based on this. The memo stated the following. The bullets that were used to kill this guy are consistent with being nine millimeter. They may have been fired from the following. Calico, FEG, Browning, Heckler & Koch, Hungarian, Massonar, Norinco, or Walther. Not so much with the Beretta. The list did not mention Beretta. In early 2000, while preparing for trial, the state assistant attorney, Gary Nicholson, noticed an inconsistency in the evidence. Brown had identified the murder weapon as a Beretta, but the memo did not include Beretta as a possible match. Nicholson called Stevenson and asked him whether the murder weapon could have been a Beretta. So then Stevenson generated a second report, this time using a margin of error or plus or minus four thousandth of an inch, and this made Beretta a possible match. At no time prior to trial did Stevenson, the firearms examiner, disclose either of the underlying reports to the state's attorney's office or the counsel. Stevenson testified at trial the murder weapon could have been a Beretta based on new information they said was provided to Nicholson. He denied having created any reports when he got the new information from the state's attorney's office. Horn was convicted to 70 years. Jackson was convicted to 45 years. So this is going over great. Stevenson, the firearms examiner, testified it could have been Beretta and denied creating any report when he got new information. So he suppressed the underlying ballistics, suppressed the reports, perjured himself on the stand, 70 years, 45 years, just all the great, just all the great over here in New Haven. In 2018, as part of a re-examination by Connecticut Federal Public Defender's Office, the New Haven Police Department produced the stolen police records and both the underlying reports. After reviewing the belatedly disclosed evidence, moved to vacate the judgments after serving 17 and 19 years in prison, respectively. Horn and Jackson filed a complaint under 1983. With regards to Stevenson's plan alleged that so these guys went to prison for murder, armed robbery, sentenced to 70 years, sentenced to 45 years, served 17 and served 19 years. And just to summarize all the horror, here's a list of things that happened. The police conducted a surveillance re record of the cell phones. It didn't match their theory. They buried the cell phone records. It wasn't disclosed to the defendants. The memo, the first memo was disclosed, but not the underlying ballistics. The second report, not the underlying ballistics. The firearms examiner got on the stand, said, yeah, definitely could have been bred up. Definitely didn't provide, didn't conduct a new report. 17 and 19 years of these lives gone. Just great over here in New Haven. Just round of applause for everyone involved in this in New Haven, from the police to the detectives, to the firearms examiner, you all are true champions of justice. I hope they name a medal after you. You are truly a b wonderful joy to the community. <sighs> Let's press on. Here's what the firearms examiner would like to offer in his defense. He's entitled to qualified immunity because it wasn't established in 1999 
that a firearms examiner had any obligation under Brady to turn over exculpatory evidence to the prosecutor. He's entitled to absolute immunity with respect to the second report because he prepared it for the prosecutor on their request. We disagree. He can't make out qualified immunity or absolute immunity. I didn't know in 1999 that I, the firearms examiner, had to provide exculpatory evidence. Oh my God. Let's read more. In 1963, there was a case called Brady. It's somewhat famous. It established an affirmative duty of a prosecutor to turn over exculpatory evidence. The Supreme Court has held that suppression by the prosecution of evidence favorable to an accused upon request violates due process, irrespective of good faith or bad faith. Brady specifically addresses disclosure obligation of prosecution. In concluding that such a duty exists, the Supreme Court relied on two prior cases. The Supreme Court has stated that con contrivance by a state to prosecute a conviction and improvement of a defendant is inconsistent with demands of justice. The Supreme Court has held deliberate suppression by state authorities of evidence favorable to defendant violates due process. In 1995, the Supreme Court held in Kyle's that the prosecutor has a duty to learn any favorable evidence known to others acting by the government, including the police. The prosecution not only has to disclose what they know, they have a duty to get to look. As in Brady, Kyle's focused on the obligation of a prosecutor. The Kyle's court acknowledged, however, that Brady is not limited to possession of stuff by the prosecution, but also includes any information in the hands of the police or their agents, for example, firearms examiner. Applying the teachings of Brady, we recognize in Walker, a government disclosure obligation applies to police. When we held the police satisfy their obligation under Brady, when they turn over exculpatory evidence to a prosecutor, the rule makes good sense, we reason, because the police may lack the legal acumen to determine whether materials constitute Brady evidence, and therefore should not be charged with making difficult decisions. So just turn it over to the prosecutor, let them figure it out. Stevenson, firearm examiner, hero to the cause over here, does not dispute that Walker clearly established the duty of police to share, nor does he contest in this appeal the reports are material. He instead provides a qualified immunity on the basis that Walker didn't apply to the state police laboratory. Oh, okay, it applies to the police, but not to you, the firearms examiner in the state police laboratory. Okay, all right. We disagree and conclude that a police forensic examiner, whether an analyst or technician, yeah, you have a duty to disclose that to the prosecutor who then has a duty to disclose it to the defendant. So there can be maybe a fair trial. How about that? That sounds like a good idea. Our conclusion based on Walker, Brady applies to forensic examiners in state criminal laboratories reinforced by our decisions. That 1999 had reached the same conclusion. The Fifth Circuit said the law sufficiently clear in 1984 that state crime lab technician would have known suppression is bad. The Sixth Circuit said in 1990, it's bad. The Tenth Circuit said in 1986, it's bad. There was some notice that might have been applicable to you in 1999. Finally, we easily reject the argument that he was simply a forensic witness or lay expert. I don't even 100% understand what that's supposed to mean. He's simply a forensic witness or a lay expert. First of all, what the hell is a lay expert? Those are mutually contradictory terms in law. You can be a layman or an expert. I don't even begin to understand what a lay expert is. Lay witnesses can offer opinions. They can offer opinions about things lay witnesses can testify to. For example, how fast was a car going? Does this picture represent, resemble a person? How old was that person? Lay witnesses can testify as opinions that lay witnesses can form opinions about. Expert witnesses can testify about things experts can testify about. What the hell is a lay expert? What is that? I, it doesn't, I don't even be, all right, I don't, my mind is breaking down. Plaintiffs allege that he was employed by the state and was responsible for analyzing physical evidence exclusively on behalf of the police. In criminal cases against plaintiff, he's alleged to have worked closely with the police, including by testing ballistics, authoring reports, and assisting the lead prosecutor in preparing for trial. 
His role went beyond that of a third party expert witness retained to help a trier of fact. He's a little bit more intimately involved in that. He works for the state laboratory. For reasons set forth, he's not entitled to qualify immunity. Stevenson asserts that he, the then just going for broke over here, Stevenson wants to argue, how about not so much with the qualified immunity, how about with the absolute immunity? Okay, Stevenson, I have absolute immunity. Let's give that a shot. That sounds like a great idea. Stevenson's asserts in this action brought by people who went to jail for a better part of their life, he has absolute immunity in creating the later report. Absolute immunity protects actions undertaken by a prosecutor in preparing for initiation of judicial proceedings and which occur in the role as advocate. This is true. A prosecutor enjoys absolute immunity for his role as an advocate. However, it does not provide immunity at least of the absolute variety, for any administrative or investigation roles. As relevant here, absolute immunity extends also to any individuals who assist who, and who act under the official's direction in performing those roles closely tied to judicial process. Not only the prosecutor gets absolute immunity, but anyone who works with him in creation of the case. So like his deputies and assistants, other people in the prosecutor's office, that's up. You know. That kind of thing. Not so much with create new evidence, no, not with that. Also, there's a more fundamental problem. We do not need to reach that question of whether or not it was in furtherance of the prosecutor's advocacy role, which incidentally it wouldn't be, but we don't even need to reach that question because there's no allegation the prosecutor requested a new report. The prosecutor apparently called and said, and simply asked whether or not it was possible the murder weapon could have been a Beretta. That's all the prosecutor said. This memo is interesting. This memo doesn't include Beretta. I wonder if it could be possible that Beretta is possible. I Maybe I should check. That seems like a good thing to do. So he calls and says, hey, firearms examiner, is it possible it could be a Beretta? So apparently based on this question, he decides to generate a completely new report with a larger margin of error, which wasn't the question the prosecutor asked. If we conclude that adjusting the margin of error constituted prosecutorial advocacy, the prosecutor didn't ask for it. He didn't say, could you do a larger margin of error? He just said, is it possible? The right answer to this question would have been no. Moreover, Horn affirmatively alleged that Nicholson never saw this report, which further suggests it wasn't created as a request. He, he never even saw the report. So for these reasons, not entitled to immunity based on this, any of this, and yeah, no. So that brings us to the end of the discussion of Vernon Horn, a guy who served the better part of his life in prison because of James Stevenson. In this case, Mr. Stevenson is a firearms examiner. He conducted a ballistics report and he did it to two thousandths of an inch and said, here's a whole bunch of firearms it could be, not so much with the Beretta. And then he didn't give the underlying report to anybody, just the memo. And then the prosecutor says, hey, this memo seems odd. And then completely not to a request, he produced a new ballistics report. And then the prosecutor did that and they prosecuted and went to jail. So the prosecutor didn't screw up here. Basically everyone else did though. The police detective who, you know, kept the evidence in his basement, the forensics examiner who suppressed the evidence, basically all that stuff. So yeah, Vernon Horn, you can sue these people for violation of your rights for whatever difference it will make for the loss of basically 20 years of your life. And that brings us to the end of the discussion of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. And until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.